Remember when I said I wouldn't make individual videos for each of these? I do. This video is a part of a series about the Mega Man Zero games. I'll spare both you and myself the intelligence insulting time wasting on explaining the basics once again. Mega Man Zero 3, it came out. It's the one people seem to really fucking like. Will I agree? Let's get right into it and find out. So you press start and hey, do you recall in the last video when I said Mega Man Zero 2 could have just been a text crawl leading into Zero 3? I was right. We rejoin our still strangely pink protagonist Zero a few months after the last game alongside his resistance pals. The young scientist detected a powerful energy signature eerily similar to the dark elf that appeared out of nowhere in the tundra. And Zero followed along on the off chance that this whole scenario happens to be plot related. Half buried in the snow, the crew come across a huge crash spaceship that looks ominously sword-like, which Zero heads in to investigate. Zero, what are, you, what, are you, what are you doing with your arms there? You feeling okay? Do I need to check the control panel? Oh, oh my god, the star levels are gone. The charge shot and saber combo can be used right from the get-go now. Thank god. I have no idea how this wasn't fixed in Zero 2, but I shall accept this gift horse and not look at its mouth. And the gifts continue to roll out via these newly minted secret data disks. You'll find them almost as soon as you begin, either lying around the stage or falling constantly from destroyed enemies. There are 180 of these that contain micro lore snippets, energy crystals, upgrade parts, and cyber elves. I am very much on board with the addition of the discs, as they at last give you something to do during stages by introducing a collectible that isn't an active detriment to your performance like cyber elves. Though on the topic of the cyber elves, I should be more optimistic, as they have received a welcome rework to their basic functionality that fixes all of my previous grievances with the system. The sad little death fairies are now split between fusion elves and satellite elves. Fusion elves are the legacy styled ones. Consume them for movement and health buffs. Using them in this way still lowers your score. Satellite elves on the other end of the spectrum are equipable to one of two available slots. These guys are significantly less prone to dying, rather they follow Zero around and give their powers to him him passively without penalty. Already a proper course correction, but the real game changer here is that the new evolution of fusion elves. They can be raised with crystals like always, but now have another level they can reach past their full power. This level will convert them into a satellite elf that can be used with no score restrictions. Absolutely perfect! Exactly how this system should have always worked. The limit of two slots keeps you from being overpowered, but the ability to use them without killing your rank no longer makes searching for cyber elves a waste of time. Now, what are we looking at for tutorial bosses this time? After the last game threw three of them at me in the opening stage, I think I'm ready for just about anything. <laughs> yo, 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 hold, hold up. Are we at the uh, final boss already? What's, uh, what's this bullshit? You're supposed to be like a stupid garbage robot or a scorpion. Whatever it is, it's not dying. That could be a problem. Well, 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 is that a shrunken head in a jar? Oh shit, I wasn't that far off. The fifth member of the California Raisins is Dr. Vile, a human science man who was banished from Neo Arcadia for starting the devastating elf wars a hundred years ago. The giant reploid accompanying him, Omega, was his main and most violent weapon in said war, and was fired into space to keep him away from society. But sometime after Elpizel almost successfully bumbling his way through a military coup, Vile returned Omega's containment unit to Earth and freed him. How is he around to do this? Why wasn't Vile just executed? I have no idea. X doesn't like violence, but he's also been shown to be more than ready to kill someone if there is serious danger to the innocent. Ask the hundreds of reploids he exploded. This old pickle jar isn't alone. He's brought a friend along with him. 
Oh, great. It's the self-righteous speaking spell. While Harpuya prostrates himself before his master, Zero isn't falling for this stuttering faker's trick at all, instantly recognizing the fabricated blue boy before him as a rebuilt copy X, though shoddily so this time, as he can't stop tripping over his words. Vile needs to find the Dark Elf for whatever he's scheming, so wanting to prove his superiority and heroism, Copy X invites Zero to try and find the Dark Elf before they do. Make a contest out of it, a race to find the Dark Elf and prove who the better legendary hero is. Vile and his gang leave, but not before dropping a line that concerns Zero, wondering if the red half amnesiac is capable of getting anything done with that body. Most curious. CL was listening to the entire conversation and quickly recalls Zero to the Resistance HQ to plot out their response to this challenge. The Hunter base has reached its most fully fleshed out iteration to date. Most every NPC has a unique design and personality, but the place still feels a bit empty and kind of pointless. Luckily, our pals over at Nintendo have an overly expensive solution to solve that problem. E-reader cards. Blah, 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 failed peripheral, needs to GBA, scan cards for extra features, nobody in America cared, so they were never brought over. We've discussed this in the past in relation to Battle Network, and the same thing applies here. Good thing for us, then, that the Zero ZX collection incorporates the 8003 e-reader cards into the gallery for easy access. These run from decor changes, like adding art to the walls and changing the weather, to sprite redesigns, like Zero's attacks in the text boxes, to, the only reason I mentioned this to you, adding extra characters to headquarters. The most intriguing of these cards spawns a cyber elf outside of the command center. You can't talk to it, but when examined, Zero says, it has a warm light, but there's a sadness to it, almost as if it remembers this base. The implication becomes more clear when you realize that the card that spawns this elf is card number 54, which depicts Elpizo from the final battle of Mega Man Zero 2. Before we get to work, Servo imparts to Zero his shield boomerang and our unique weapon for this title, the Recoil Rod. True to its name, the Recoil Rod is good at shoving things and pushing things. Charged shots can not only reposition larger objects, but also blast away shielded enemies, and if fired downwards, can Scrooge McDuck Zero high into the air. This thing gets a lot of use and doesn't feel like a superfluous extra option like the Triple Rod. Rather, it fits nicely in Zero's moveset. As a consistently helpful utility tool, I found myself often switching to. I can't wait for the next game to fuck this up. Back in the control room, the team has pinpointed the location of the Reploids who are either advancing New Arcadia's military efforts or hunting for the Dark Elf. These are the Hachishinkan, the Eight Gentle Judges, Mudos Reploids responsible for overseeing law and order in Neo Arcadia that, thanks to a method I don't think is ever elaborated on, are now under Vile's control. They're capable of transforming between their humanoid forms and their more animalistic and abstract punishment forms at will, and have always existed despite not being mentioned until this point. I'll let you know now that I'm not going to be breaking down each of these fights individually like I did before, because I think you get the idea of how the bosses in the series go by now. Tough until you learn their patterns, some of the arenas are too big and you can't see when and what attacks are coming, using the charge slash and the element chip that they're weak to makes them crumble into dust. There just isn't much to say. Their names also continue to be absolutely awful gibberish. So let's start things off with Blazin' Flizzard. Aside from the ball-busting soundtrack, what I do want to point out is that Inti Creates is finally doing something about the screen crunch, and it's pretty clever. During sections that require fast, reaction-based movement, the camera will pan forward slightly to give you a better idea of what's ahead of you, resulting in much less jumping off blindly and landing on spikes. Something Zero, One, and especially Two were overflowing with. I'm really glad they absolutely and completely acknowledged and tried to put a fix for this problem, especially in a game where your rank is so important. On the other hand, there's another new system meant to soften the game's difficulty that I feel isn't executed very well. 
Cyberspace is a concept that has existed in the main Mega Man universe for a while, and made multiple appearances in the X Games, wherein it exists as a sort of parallel dimension, where the fabric of reality is very pliable and distortion-prone. Cyberspace is directly tied to the real world, and many ways have been found throughout the series to manipulate reality by messing around with it. That's exactly how the Cyber Elves are meant to work, actually, by changing cyberspace to rewrite aspects of the normal world. This is why they die when used, as the cyberspace is a sort of afterlife for technological beings. In Zero Three, there are gates into cyberspace that can be entered where your visor becomes coated in a thick layer of green jelly. When in cyberspace, all of your cyber elves with this AI con will activate without dying and without penalty until you leave. Oh, sorry, I lied. Entering cyberspace during a mission will deduct five points from your score no matter what, which doesn't sound like a lot at first, but for me personally, my score always hovered in about a five to ten point buffer zone from the 86 points needed for an A rank. You have to do crazy well to get a 91 or higher, which a new player who needed the help wouldn't be able to get. But really, I wouldn't use it anyway, because cyberspace also cannot be taken advantage of to defeat bosses or mid-bosses, so you're forced to leave before entering any transition gates. You know, I'm sure someone other than me has pointed this out before, but the funniest part of this is that it's almost exactly the same as the infamous method of playing as Zero himself in Mega Man X3. You have to manage manually activate and constantly deactivate this huge power up before and after every boss or mini boss, which are the only challenging parts of the game anyway, and it has an obnoxious risk to use that means you probably won't use it. Taking everything into account, cyberspace is a neat concept to mess around with when say revisiting stages to get all the collectibles, but as a tool to help new or weaker players or to give a hand with a stage you're stuck on, it's basically worthless because it can't be used on the actually hard parts of the game. But enough of that negative Nancy whinging of mine. I've just defeated our first boss and have some more positive changes to praise. Zero is still ranked on performance at the end of each mission based on a handful of factors. A consistent A rank is still needed to learn each boss's EX skill, which I still don't agree with. But there are other power-ups for Zero to acquire now, so I won't harp on this as much. In opposition to the previous games, where three levels gave you elemental chips and the other five dropped jack shit, most every level now houses alternate augmentation chips for Zero's armor. These chips go in one of three slots and grant anything from the expected three elements, super armor, passive weapon charging, jumping on water, Zero's a really helpful double jump which has been missing from the last two games. A plus character progression changes all around, you love to see it. Moving on to the next stage and uh, ugh. There's only one bad mission in Mega Man Zero Three, so I suppose I'm glad we can get it out of the way so early. Here on the waterfront, Zero is thrust into a race against Childre Ina Rabita to catch up to the Dark Elf. Ooh, a race. I love fast-paced platformers. This sounds like a really fun idea for a level. Ah, right. I forgot. So the entire race amounts to you constantly dash jumping forward and crossing your fingers that you don't crash into something and insta-die. It also means that the level has to be revisited to grab the majority of the collectibles since you won't have time. But hold the fuck up, because when I finished this level the first time, my mission score was a big fat zero. Turns out I'm entirely wrong. This is because even though Ina Rabita says, let's see who gets to the elf first and then rushes into the water, the actual goal here is not to beat them, but to press a series of switches that lower the water level before the boss reaches and destroys them. <laughs> what? Now to be fair, CL says to get ahead of it because there's a switch that will stop Ina Rabita, but I figured it would be an obvious unmissable button at the end of the stage, you know, just flavor text. Not a series of buttons hidden throughout the level. Make no mistake, you still have to jump around blindly though, so enjoy the stupid amount of spikes that litter the stage for some reason. Hitting all the switches lowers the water level in the boss room, but even with it, Ina Rabita is probably the easiest of the main bosses. The next two stages don't really have anything of note. They're just nice levels. A factory where you use the recoil rod to blast these swinging mallets, and a mission I really like consisting of a blown out and abandoned building, where the fire chip can be used to clear out the foliage and find secrets in all the hidden rooms. More environmental interaction, especially with the element chips, is always good. Since there are only three elemental attacks now instead of the eight that was featured in other Mega Man games, and they're unmissable, I kinda wish the Mega Man Zero series would have more puzzles 
levels and rooms dedicated to using the element chips in creative ways. But I don't think there's a point in any of the games where the element chips are required to make progress. Oh well. The first four judges are taken out by Zero, causing Copy X and Vile to get desperate. They track the energy of the Dark Elf to a heavily populated residential district, and refusing to lose track of it again, Vile loads Omega into a fucking missile and shoots him at the city. Zero warps to the launch site as fast as he can to try and stop them, but it's revealed that Vile has managed to manipulate the baby elves into thinking he's on their side, with a promise of bringing them back to their mother. This leads to Kree and Priye attacking Zero when he reaches the control center, and though he wins the fight, Zero's now too late to stop the impact. <laughs> Omega at last absorbs the Dark Elf, and though Harpuya flies in to help again, it, you didn't really think he was going to accomplish anything, did you? He and Zero are trans back to base, and before they even have time to take stock of the clusterfuck of a situation they find themselves in, the gang receive a transmission from Copy X. The Faker demanding that they hand over the CL system in exchange for a peaceful conflict resolution. As I've said before, there is no way Neo Arcadia would ever go back on all the horrific shit they've done, whether the energy crisis is solved or not, and CL holds the same opinion. In response, Neo Arcadia sends out multiple Mudos Reploid led squad quadrants to close in on the resistance, and with Harpuya still out of commission, that just leaves Zero to halt all of their advances. Okay, next four gentle judges, let's see them. Alright, only three, but it, hold on. Those are... Ugh, we're doing this. The Reploids guarding the next three areas are Anubis, Hana Machine, and Stagroff, all bosses resurrected from Zero One. While their stages are throwbacks as well, I'm happy to report, contrary to my initial worries, that these are only asset flips. The layouts themselves are entirely new ones that just reuse terrain and visuals from the prior two installments. Well, I'm usually against this form of artificial playtime lengthening via recycling, the Mega Man series as a whole has always struggled with longevity, relying on their difficulty to slow play down and force retries, which only turns into an issue once you become good at them, and the challenge no longer slows you down. To cut to the chase, these games barely clock in at two or three hours otherwise, so I'll be more than willing to have three extra levels. Clearing that trio of reruns out will thin New Arcadia's numbers and cause their remaining troops to back down, granting Zero an opening to break in and find Copy X. Slicing your way through the base, you might take note of these monitors covering the back walls, displaying what looks to be Zero's status. But if that's the case, it does raise the question, why are there so many Omega symbols back there? Zero faces off with Copy X for a second time, and I guess Dr. Vile didn't bother giving him a new CPU or anything because he's rocking the same pattern as before. After humbling the faker yet again, the real X decides that he wants to come and talk, but before he gets the chance to bore him to death with another violence bad monologue, Copy X desperately activates his armed phenomena form. Only to find that Vile had placed a bomb in his body that would cause him to explode were he ever to attempt to do so. But why would he nerf Copy X like that if he was meant to stop Zero? Unless, of course, that was never his intention. Dr. Vile sends out a message to all of Neo Arcadia, regretfully informing them that Master X has been assassinated by Zero, making Vile himself the de facto leader of the city effective immediately. You know, the killed 70% of all life on Earth guy. There is in-game text that directly states the humans are okay with this. <laughs> The only way to possibly excuse how this ludicrously stupid plan actually works is to presume that the humans of Neo Arcadia have sub-kindergarten level awareness. And luckily for Vile, that's the established canon. Mega Man has always kind of had this weird world building where because the cast are primarily secret government fighting robots, humans and civilians in general are never really focused on and treated as props for storytelling. 
X and Zero's plan to get Neo Arcadia off their backs has failed spectacularly. If anything, the pressure is going to get worse with Vial in charge. So they immediately get back to searching for the Doctor and figuring out what his big plan here is leading to. The operating team has discovered the whereabouts of the four remaining gentle judges, so hopefully there's some valuable intel in the regions they're protecting. First up is a power plant the Neo Arcadians have turned off, despite all of this bullshit being started by a lack of energy, so they must be doing something both important and shifty here. The gimmick of this place is, and I mean this, powering up each room with the elect chip so that robo moths will be attracted to the lights and get out of your way. It's different, I'll give it that. Though the second half of the stage, I'm not a big fan of because it's completely fucking borked. The very first time I went through this level off recording, it was fine. But my subsequent New Game Plus playthrough was a glitchy mess. There are these tilting girders that you're meant to use to clear some spike coated rooms. But despite me not having edited the game or done any glitches or anything of the sort, the girders around the level required for platforming all spawn in the wrong position, just sort of phasing into random walls. Even dying and coming back to the stage wasn't resetting anything. So so the only way I was able to get past these areas was damage boosting with the double jump, an ability I wouldn't have even had unless I was playing New Game Plus because it comes from this level. Next, there's a sledding stage where you slide along the slopes, which would be fine, except the camera doesn't do that panning thing that the lava plant did. You're not forced to use the board, it doesn't really matter, you could just play through the level normally, it's fine, but it's really weird that they solved the screen size limitations for a single room at the beginning of the game and never used that technique ever again in any similar scenarios. There's a sunken library where we go to gather data on Vial and the Elf Wars. It requires you to check a computer database to see which specific rooms you're looking for, lest you be stuck in trial and error hell. Not an amazing idea for a stage, but it is unique and shakes things up a bit, so I'll give it that. And topping it all off is the obligatory beat em up elevator level. Just use the recoil rod and shove everybody off the side. <laughs> Well, I did all the work. Let's go check in on that slacker Harpuya while the data is being processed. He's awake now, but not happy about being helped by the resistance and being tossed away by Neo Arcadia's new leader. He heads off to do the, I don't know, fucking something. Pay Capcom $20, maybe you'll be able to figure it out. That's how we give out lore in this series. Back at the command station, the crew is no closer to finding Vile than they were before. So thank goodness he has the common courtesy to call us up and let us know exactly what he's been doing. Vile's goal has been to use Omega to amplify the Dark Elves' influence influence, and spread its mind control abilities around the world, a plan he's been working on for years in the name of safety, to force all Reploids to be subservient to humans, in a supposed attempt to prevent events like the Maverick Wars from ever happening again. Though in reality by this point, it's just an excuse for his revenge-fueled tantrum over being banished. Dr. Vile called this plan of his Project Elpizo. Some time ago, a nobody pencil pusher reploid from Neo Arcadia, designated only by his serial code TK31, was dispatched with X's information specialist Sage Harpuya to gather data from a recently discovered ancient library that had sunken into the sea. The same library we visited earlier, actually. During the mission, TK31 wanders off to the central data center and begins aimlessly poking around where he shouldn't. This data room is あ。なんなんだこの記録はこんなもの見たことも聞いたこともないぞ。どうした？オーバーフロー化。歴史が巻き戻っていく。イレギュラー戦争。シグマアンチボディプログラム。マザーエルフ。光が世界を救う。希望の誕
A few days later, TK31 was branded a maverick, presumably for now possessing such confidential and dangerous information, and is almost arrested by Harpuya when a resistance cell attacks at the same time and escorts him away to safety. This leads to TK31's defection from Neo Arcadia and eventual climbing of the ranks, all the way up to becoming the resistance's leader. TK31, misunderstanding the true intentions of Project Elpizo, took the operation's name for himself as a sign of his new resolve, and became dedicated to finding the Dark Elf, intending to use its power to end Neo Arcadia's violent inequality and bring peace to the world. Then, you know. Elpizo had unwittingly done a huge chunk of the heavy work for Vile, stealing Kriye and Priye from the Resistance and freeing the Dark Elf by destroying X's body. With all of the pieces now in place, Vile's brainwashing activates, giving him dominion over all Reploids. Barring Zero, who I guess is immune since the Mother Elf was created from his DNA in the first place. The other Reploids nearby are saved by X, who very conveniently can maintain a small barrier to protect the people at the Resistance base from Omega's signal, leaving Zero to head to the bowels of Sub-Arcadia to stop Dr. Vile without his help. Sub-Arcadia is the only area in the game where entering cyberspace is required to collect something. There's a boss door hidden in one of the rooms that only contains a disc with a log entry. This entry refers to Hidden Phantom, the fourth guardian who, unsuccessfully, kaboomed himself to try and kill Zero. But cast your mind back to the beginning of the video where I explained that cyberspace is the afterlife for technological beings. If you return to this room while in cyberspace, the remnant DNA soul of Phantom will be waiting to challenge you, because I guess he didn't get the hint the first two times. The developers took note of the fact you'll be fighting with all your buffs in cyberspace, and by that I mean he's the same fight as Zero One, but now there are a million extra projectiles haphazardly thrown in and he has a lot of health. Defeating him gets us the supremely useful Ultima Foot Chip, which combines all of the boot-related armor upgrades into one item. After being forced to delete Kriye and Priye as they launch another attack on him, Zero finds himself trapped in the boss rush stage. La di da Mega Man tradition. This run can be a hell of a challenge on a bare bones playthrough. Not only do you have to get through the level and fight all of the bosses, but then you have to go against the final boss, which has three more phases, totaling another eight health bars to knock down. Make sure you've at least found the sub tank and bring a few lives with you for this one. Yeah, uh, Dr. Vile's stated motivation is basically that he's just really racist against reploids and views them as lesser beings beneath humans. He believes that humans are the only living things truly capable of understanding the pleasures of creation and thusly views himself as a godlike figure that should control all mechanical life. Mechanical life like his giant robot friend. Dodge the sword, dash under the rings, you see what you gotta do here. I'm infinitely more interested in Omega as a concept, like even just his name. It makes Omega the perfect foil to a character named Zero. He's a being that's designed to bring about the end of the world, the Omega, the end of all things, a conclusion. In other words, a Zero. Hey, does, um, does Omega's second form look like something to you? The green sword and head gem, the red helmet fins, and its opposite side has a blue helmet with an arm cannon. I'm sure that's nothing. 
The fight itself is good too. Uh, barring this one attack, because it seems like every Mega Man Zero boss has to have one super awkward to avoid move. He's got a lot of health, but he's a big stationary target, so you always have openings to attack. Successfully obliterating Omega's armored form during the free fall, Zero manages to avoid the explosions and debris, only to find that he's landed in the ruins beneath the city, the remains of the laboratory where he was sealed away a hundred years ago. Fittingly poetic when you see what happens next. <laughs> Hold on just one second. I got that remastered soundtrack around here somewhere. オメガ。モンストリーの俺と Hey, fuck that climactic finish. Omega's still alive, thanks to the Dark Elf. Zero's too exhausted to fight back on his own, but for the first time in this game, Harpuya arrives to actually help, accompanied now by Leviathan and Fefnir, who Harpuya and X repaired off-screen. More audio drama exclusive lore, just, just forget about it. Then it's time for some X. Position. Have I used that joke before? God, I hope not. X decides to walk on back that plot twist, clarifying that Omega is not the real Zero and was only born from his body, not his soul. When Zero sealed himself the first time, not the second time from the audio dramas, they removed his brain to try and find a cure for the Maverick virus. That's when Vile stole his empty original body and used it to create Omega. The body Zero's been using since then is just a recreation, which at last gives lore significance to the fact that he's fucking pink. There is some early concept art of Omega that implies he would have had an appearance closer to Zero's original design, note the large boots and hands, but for what I assume was technical or space reasons or something, they ended up just going with a palette swap of Zero's current design. But none of that matters, you know, in the end, it, it doesn't matter if he's really Zero or not. Choose your destiny, empowerment, all that. Other anime themes. Zero musters up all the energy he has left, and with one final strike, er Traces his past self from existence. And on the topic of erasing the past, X's energy has finally depleted, causing him to lose his grip on the living world. His lingering regrets of the horrible totalitarian nightmare he accidentally created put to rest. Because Zero's gonna be there to clean it all up for him. Bye bye X, see you when you get turned into a rock.
that story, huh? Miles ahead of the last two. It's like an actual plot with twists and turns and betrayals and three proper acts. The game's increased length from about two hours to about four certainly helps the pacing, allowing for more events to be spread out more naturally. The only reservation I have from showering this narrative with unrestrained praise is that almost all of the best parts of it are implications. Don't panic, this isn't me about to say the game sucks. More so a look into how none of the Zero games got hit harder by GBA limitations than this one. One. The literal climax of the story, that is, from the moment Omega is revealed to be Zero up until the credits, is maybe five minutes. Zero only says one single line in response to hearing that his entire life is a lie. That little speech at the end isn't in the game anywhere. I put that there. It's from the l 4s audio drama. In the game itself, we never get to see Zero react or struggle with this idea of being a fake at all, or the potential guilt he feels that his power was used to kill billions of people. Especially bizarre because the first Zero game clearly foreshadowed this, with Zero asking CL what would happen if he wasn't really Zero. But Zero 3 does absolutely nothing with this plot point and doesn't even reference it. Taken as is, as the literal sequence of events purely constrained to the Zero games themselves, the ending is good, but it's not great yet. If I put aside my personal feelings as a longtime Mega Man connoisseur and try to look a little more critically, I can't say it's perfect even if I want to. And the issue arises if the story was being played by someone who isn't, A, invested in this universe and its supplemental material all the way back to the X series, and B, willing to let their imagination do the bulk of the heavy lifting on the character side. You know, if people don't keep up with art book notes, lore, the audio dramas, I can see how the impact is lessened for some people who don't want to do the extra research. While I don't agree, I can understand why some people don't like the story of the Zero series because half of the story isn't in the games. What makes the ending amazing is when you have a wider understanding of this world, of the tons of vital events that have taken place off screen, and the development and personality and regrets of Zero as a character, almost all of which exists not in the actual text of the Zero games, but in other games and mediums. Now, if you have been invested in the story for years, like I have, it makes Zero's battle with Omega feel like the culmination of his entire story, where Zero finally finds and accepts his own identity, free of the manipulation of others, and in defeating what is essentially an evil vision of all the pain and destruction he's caused, finding the strength to move on and forgive himself. That's about all I have to say about the story. And I don't really have any closing thoughts on the gameplay this time. I think I said everything I want to say during the video already. It's a huge improvement over the previous two games. They fixed all the character progression issues. And running around, jumping, shooting, and stabbing things is as satisfying as it's ever been. So let's get to the question you actually want to ask me. Is Mega Man Zero 3 the best Mega Man game? Possibly? I know that's a half-assed answer, I'm sorry. The best comes down to taste, obviously, but the graphics, music, controls, secrets, and story are shockingly good for a series that started the way it did. There's some stuff that's just not to my taste. The only flaws I would say exist are that one of the areas is kind of bad, and that's mostly just because the game does a bad job of explaining what you're supposed to be doing in the water base. And while the game has cut down greatly on these sudden off-screen insta-kills, they are definitely still there, just Stop putting spikes in places where they aren't clearly visible. <laughs> I do not want to slowly walk around and wall slide down every single surface so I don't accidentally touch a spike with one pixel and die. Those two nitpicks aside, I would say it is still a clear contender for the best, and I can easily understand why someone would put it on that pedestal, but I still prefer the X games. I'll elaborate more on why in the final video when we're wrapping up this whole series. My preferences aside, Zero 3 is a massive improvement over both Zero 1 and 2 and is ideal where the series should have started in the first place. It's certainly one of the best Mega Man games, but I'm curious to see if Inti Creates can finish off this project of theirs on an equally strong note, or if Zero 4 will burn up and fizzle out on impact.